and you can see the blue dye is being put in here, a couple little points here, or in the midline, I might inject a center point. So I try to get the injection not directly um, either on the midline, but I try and have it not go too far lateral to the midline because as we proceed laterally, the mentalis muscle is here. The next muscle that attaches to the lip is the depressor labii inferioris, the DLI. We like to not get any injection into the DLI. That muscle is a little bit deeper than the DAO, and the DAO is the next injection that we'll talk about. So here's the DAO. It attaches to the modiolus. It's a triangular muscle. It can come very far forward, and it goes back all the way to this back edge. If we look here, this is the backmost extent of the DAO. Just behind that are some platysma fibers, and we know which are the platysma and which are the DAO. The DAO is more oriented like this, the platysma is oriented more lateral to medial. They are in the same plane. Now what is important is because the DLI is right here where my forceps are and the DAO is here and, and the DAO overlies the DLI, we would like to not put any injection anteriorly in the DAO because that will catch some of the posterior fibers of the DLI. So what I'd like to do if I inject is come very posteriorly in the DAO and inject something like that. A couple little points along the jawline and just lateral. I like to look at where the marionette line is and I go just lateral to it. So here's where the marionette line would sit if the skin were down and I go just lateral to that area. And this is where my injection is. Note that injection is not so medial, even though there's some DAO fibers here, because if I put this part, if I injected this part of the DAO, I would catch some DLI. So we're going to talk about the anatomy of the mid face and the lower portion of the face. We're staring at the left side of a cadaver at this point. And from medial to lateral, we see the mentalis muscle, the DLI, the depressor labii inferioris that attaches to the lip, the DAO that attaches to the modiolus, the corner of the mouth. And as we proceed posteriorly along the mandible, we have the posterior border of the DAO and then the platysma muscle. If we cut through the platysma muscle, and we look directly down onto the mandible, we see the tortuous facial artery. The facial artery is here with the facial vein. The facial vein is just posterior to it. The facial vein proceeds superiorly as a straight line. The artery goes toward the corner of the mouth and it becomes very tortuous. That tortuosity is variable. Intimately attached with the facial artery are branches of the facial nerve, as you see a branch intimately attached to it. There are other branches of the facial nerve here. The facial nerve branches run in the fascia that overlies the masseter muscle and the parotid gland, layer five, the deep fascia of the face, also called the parotidomasseteric fascia. Within this fascia that overlies the parotid gland posteriorly, the masseter muscle here, or branches of the facial nerve that come along it and then innervate the muscles of facial expression on their deep surface. Also within the parotidomasseteric fascia runs the parotid duct. The parotid duct, and we see a little green suture placed underneath the parotid duct, um, the parotid duct comes out of the front of the parotid gland. It runs in the parotidomasseteric fascia it heads medially, it pierces the buccinator muscle and enters the mouth opposite the second upper molar tooth, the maxillary molar tooth. It enters opposite that, so it enters right about in here. So within the parodromasoteric fascia run branches of the facial nerve and 
the parotid duct. We're going to go over the anatomy of the lower half of the face and when we look at the face you can see the mandible and on top of the mandible are several muscles going from medial or central to lateral. There's the mentalis muscle, the depressor labii inferioris that attaches to the lip, the depressor anguli oris that attaches to the corner of the mouth. Then in the small area between the DAO, the depressor anguli oris, and the masseter muscle are some slips of the platysmal muscle. These have been cut to show the mandible and also what we see as we go more posteriorly is the facial artery as it comes up and crosses the mandible and it begins to become torturous and go towards the corner of the mouth. Just behind it is the facial vein that is straight and going over the top of it running in the parotidomasseteric fascia is the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve. You can see that nerve ducking down just below the mandible, coming over the top of the facial artery and vein, and then running towards some of the mimetic musculature of the face. It's important because many people who inject deoxycholic acid, trademarked in the, in the United States as Kybella, have increased its indication from that which is in the submental area and they're starting to inject jowl fat. And you can see the closeness of the marginal mandibular branch of the facial nerve to that jowl fat. Um, and certainly uh, deoxycholic acid is a neurotoxic um, substance and so it can take out that nerve even though that may be transient. So we see the branches of the facial nerve this is the marginal mandibular branch. We also see one of the upper buccal branches here, and the buccal branch runs over the top of the masseter, and it's always in anatomical location next to Stenson's duct or the parotid duct. We can see them both running in the parotidomasseteric fascia. Uh, the duct goes on top of the fascia, comes out of the parotid gland, and then pierces the buccinator muscle to enter the mouth, the oral cavity opposite the second maxillary molar tooth. When we look at the masseter muscle, we can inject that with botulinum toxin. And because there is a muscle that runs in here that has been removed, the rhizorius, running up at about this le level, we don't want to hit the rhizorius muscle. So all masseter injections should be relatively inferior. Different people describe this differently, some describing a box where we inject here, 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 but not too superiorly, and here. These might be the four ears. Some people will uh, describe a triangle where two injections are done inferiorly and one is done superiorly. My uh, injection of botulinum toxin units would be 15 to 20 units as an initial dose per side, and I might spread that into three to four aliquots. As we go more posteriorly, we see the parotid gland, and we can see that lobulated gland on top of that runs its fascia, the parotid masseter fascia. Now, we can also augment for reasons of filling. Some patients will come in and want augmentation of their mandibular angle. What I try to do is augment the angle region with either a perpendicular or a tangential injection. I like the perpendicular injection here and I will inject deep right onto the bone. This is where my injection is. And I'm looking at the skin deciding where exactly I want the high point of the mandibular angle to be. Patients will do this for style and structure of their mandible. Some patients that come in with aging will have a strong mandible and then will look gaunt or hollow in the area behind the mandible just in front of the ear. That is now a superficial injection.
that's above the parotid and very superficial, injecting some filler behind the mandible, in front of the ear, in, this, in the immediate subcutaneous tissue. And obviously small amounts of that need to be injected into the space. So these are the injections with botulinum toxin or with filler in this posterior mandibular region. We will now talk about the anatomy of the temple. Uh, the temple skin has been removed and it consists of some posterior skin that is hair bearing and some anterior skin that is non hair bearing. Obviously the thickness of the two hair and not hair bearing skin is different. Between the skin and the immediate superficial fascia is dense, relatively dense adhesion and getting the skin off is a little bit tedious getting it off of the superficial fascia. We're staring now at the superficial fascia of the temple. This is also called the temporoparietal fascia. Within the layer of the temporoparietal fascia runs the superficial temporal artery and vein. We see here the frontal branch of the superficial temporal artery and more posteriorly is the parietal branch. It bifurcates here. The superficial temporal artery is one of the two terminal branches of the external carotid artery, the other terminal branch being the internal maxillary artery. If we fold down the temporoparietal fascia in a layer, we will stare at the temporalis muscle fascia or deep temporal fascia. That often has two layers, and those layers envelop the temporal fat pad. The areas that we can inject when we inject a temple include injecting superficially. The risk of a superficial injection is that we will get some product within the superficial temporal artery or one of the branches thereof. Because there are communicating branches from this, an external carotid artery, to the internal carotid branches of the supraorbital and supratrochlear, we can get blindness from an injection of the superficial temporal artery. So we can inject superficial to it between the skin and superficial fascia. We can also inject in the gliding plane between superficial and deep fascia. This gliding plane is very good for a cannula. The cannulas can get into this plane and easily slide, and this is a sliding plane between these two layers. The last place that can be injected is deep to the temporalis muscle, which we will show in just a second. The temporalis muscle is supplied by the third branch of the cranial nerve number five, the trigeminal nerve. If we're going to inject deep to it, we usually use a perpendicular orientation rather than a tangential one. So for superficial injections, we like the tangential injection. For the deep injection down on bone, we like the perpendicular orientation. We're going to peel that back and look at the deep temporal fascia. So that's where the the sliding layer is, and this is a good layer if you're an injector to inject with a cannula because this glides. Between these two layers is a fairly quick dissection plane. Deep to this, the deep temporal fascia, and by the way, in the superficial layer of the deep temporal fascia runs the frontal branch or temporal branch of the facial nerve coming up this way. We can peel this back, and this exposes the temporalis muscle. The temporalis muscle is housed in the temporal fossa. It's supplied by the third branch of the fifth cranial nerve, the trigeminal nerve. We can see the edge of the temporal fossa right here. This is called the conjoined tendon, and we can see how the, the temporalis muscle is tightly adherent. Cutting this deep temporal fascia away from here required sharp dissection 
and careful elevation of getting this off. This is continuous with the periosteum of the, of the forehead.